which case, hello everybody and welcome to Milton Keynes Literature Festival. Uh, if I could ask you for the time being to mute yourselves, uh, let me also introduce my colleague John, who I think is probably muting you whether you've done it or not, because we have the power. Um, welcome to this evening. This sadly is the last of our Zoom based events for 2020, uh, but lovely to see that we're going out on a high and that we've got such a lovely audience here tonight. Uh, if you want to find out what we're going to be doing next year, uh, we'd love to know okay, too. Okay. We're still working on that. Uh, but no. you can follow us on Twitter or on Facebook as at MKLitFest. Or if you go to our website, which is www.mklitfest.org, no. you can sign up for email newsletters and you will be the first no, to do when we have something sorted out for next year. Uh, I will be your host and compare for this evening, uh, supported by John but I will be doing as little of the speaking as, as possible. I'm really here just to, to compare. Uh, at the end of the session, we will throw it open to you so you can ask your own questions of, of David and Tanya. Uh, you should all be able to see the chat window. So if questions occur to you as David and Tanya are reading and talking, please stick your questions in there and then we can go through them and try and find you to unmute you so you can ask it in person at the end of the event. Uh, we will also be recording this. Uh, so if you really are <coughs> utterly mortified at the idea of, of anybody else ever seeing you, turn your camera off, but we would much rather see your lovely faces. Uh, and I know David and Tanya would almost certainly rather see your lovely faces as that's an audience, bless them, than we're about the only way that the, our lovely writers can get one right now. So we're glad to have had this opportunity. Uh, I think John will at some point also stick into the chat window the address for our YouTube channel because you can go and look at the other events we've had this season. Uh, we had a wonderful session with John McCulloch and Sophia Blackwell, two up and coming British poets, and a fascinating evening with the Reverend Peter Laws. Uh, and if you told me a couple of months ago, I would spend an hour and a half listening to an ordained vicar telling me about horror stories and what frightens human beings and why faith isn't that important. Uh, I'd have been <laughs> rather disbelieving, but he was wonderful and fascinating. So I recommend that one. Uh, but tonight is all about flash fiction, uh, literature that puts the short into short stories uh, and then edits it out to try and save the word count. Uh, I'm not going to go into great depth about trying to give you a definition of what is or isn't uh, flash, flash fiction, although I'm guessing there's a kind of general rule of thumb that it means a short story of about 1500 words or less, but it could be much, much shorter than that. Uh, if you've not heard of it before, you've probably heard one famous, very, very short flash fiction story, which is, is the, the famous Hemingway one for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Uh, and just reflect for a moment just how much of a story you can tell in six words, given, given that example. Uh, other people have, have defined it as, what was the quote I found earlier? Prose poetry with a narrative arc. Uh, although that seems to suggest something very lyrical, which isn't necessarily the case. But anyway, enough from me. Let me introduce the first of our two readers this evening. Both these people are real prize practitioners of, of flash fiction and we're delighted to have them here. Uh, David Gaffney, who will be speaking to you first, has produced a, a wide range of work that includes collections of short and very short stories which he calls mm -hmm. Sawn Off Tales. Uh, he's also written a story using Lost Cat posters, a set of stories about every junction on the M62, stories told in a mobile confessional box for Paul Literature Festival, uh, station stories in which six writers linked to the audience with wireless headphones performed at Manchester Piccadilly Station, as well as novels, operas and a live graphic novel. Uh, David's new novel, Out of the Dark, is, is out now, published by Confingo, and he has a new graphic novel uh, written with Dan Berry called Rivers, which will be published in May next year. Uh, I'll leave you with a, a lovely quote from The Guardian about David's work, which I think is probably a, a good way of summing up flash fiction as any, uh, which was uh, 150 words by Gaffney are more worthwhile than novels by a good many others. And we we're about to get a lot more than 150 words from him. So that's a whole bookshelf coming at you right now. 
So let me hand over to David. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, if you wonder what the strange light is behind me, I'm experimenting with a slideshow while we read. So we'll see how that goes. Um, um, so I'm going to read. When I started out writing flash fiction, I was more interested, I think, in the sort of restraint of it, to be honest. And all my fiction when I started out writing, which is in my first book, um, Sawn Off Tales, um, was exactly 150 words long. So I tended to stick with that really, really short uh, frame framework. And, and I've, I'm, I'll read you a few of those and maybe a few that are slightly longer, but nothing probably longer than about three or 400 words. I reckon that's my longest. I think Tanya goes a bit longer. She's more of a long distance flash fictioner. She'll go 300, she'll go 400, e even more. But mine, are, so, so I haven't written any for a while. So you might know some of these from, from things you've read in the past. Most of the stories you'll hear are in Sawn Off Tales and a few other books you can get on Salt. Um, this one's called Happy Place. He hated grocery shopping, hated the time it took, but he came up with a method. People bought the same things more or less. So he would look for someone of his type, sneak up behind them, and roll their fully laden trolley off to the checkout. It made life interesting. Often there were things he would never have bought. Once there was a fat orange pumpkin, but today he was in trouble. He had been stealing mostly from women because he liked the sense of order to their selections, but his victim had spied him and was stomping over. There were women's products in the cart so it was going to be difficult. He decided to pretend he knew her. Darling, I'll just get eggs. We've got eggs, the woman chirped. Listen, do you want to go out to the car? You look stressed. You can listen to your tape. Thank you. 150 words, so it's, it's get in and get out with this sort of length. Um, when Debbie left, I ate nothing but potato smiles with no frills ketchup. One day, I looked at the fluffy orange discs grinning up at me and decided to save one. I stuck it to the wall next to my bed and it cheered me up. The next day, I saved another, but I'd had one of my funny days. So I stuck this one upside down to make a frown. I did this for years and the pattern reminded me how well I was doing. The man from environmental health had a big oblong body built for blocking doorways. The neighbors are talking about a smell, he said. I locked the door and made him sit while I removed the smiles and heaped them on a plate in front of him. The sauce bottle was rimmed with decaying ketchup scabs. I squeezed, squeezed hard till his plate was full. Thank you. I'm, I, I'm seeing myself on Zoom and I'm kind of jerking around a bit. Is the, is the connection working all right, Dave? Oh, everyone's muted. It's working fine, David. Yeah. We, we, you... can, we can hear you perfectly and we can see you slightly jerkily. But it, on Zoom, expectations of, of video are low. Uh, the words are terrific. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll crack on. This is called Everything's West of Something. Here, catch, I said, and time slowed down as the vase arced through the air. You can discover everything about your girlfriend by tossing a breakable object towards her. Is she poised, confident in her judgments? Does she seem willing to take responsibility for someone else's actions? Is she comfortable with spontaneity? What is her attitude to risk, debt, transgression, sin, guilt? How does she experience the passing of time? Does she appear to believe in an afterlife, an interventionist God, ghosts, fate, predestination? Does she demonstrate a belief that character is learned? Is she concerned with the existential? 
You learn most if the object belongs to someone else. Watch the vase, watch the girl, and you will know all these things. I might have gone off. And you will find out if she loves you. Am I still on? You're still on, yes. Oh, sorry, the screen went. And she will find out if she loves you. We looked at the porcelain shards, then out through the rain speckled window. The gate said West Woods. She was the first girl I'd dated whose house had no number. Yeah, Zoom's just gone completely weird and now I can only see myself, but as long as everyone's all right out there, I'll just keep reading to my own face. <laughs> Jake invented a prescription glass windscreen for his car so that he could drive without wearing his corrective lenses. He enjoyed the feeling of freedom, no plastic pads digging into his nose. And he had the added advantage that car thieves couldn't drive the vehicle unless they happened to have the same degree of myopia. Jennifer needed a lift. However, she soon began to complain. She couldn't see, everything was blurred. And to stop herself being sick, she had to stick her head out of the window like a dog. You idiot, she said to him when he dropped her off. He wouldn't ring her again. A permanent relationship would mean grinding the windscreen to suit two different people. And he could imagine the arguments. It would be the self-cleaning bedsheet saga all over again. He went to bed, turned up the shipping forecast and drifted to sleep. So I'm going to do a slightly longer one now. I did a project for the Humber Mouth Literature Festival a few years ago, which, is, um, which was called The uh, 23 Stops to Hull and was a set of short stories, each one about all the 23 junctions between Liverpool and Hull, two of which are Ikea, by the way. So you get one Ikea story, not two. So there's a little story about every town. And this story uh, was set in a town called Eggborough. So there's anyone in Eggborough you, you might know about this. When you live here in Eggborough, Mr. Fuller said, you don't even see the towers. It's as if the towers aren't there. They're not there to all intents and purposes. I mean, they are there, but they're not, not really. I accept that when an outsider sees a house in Eggborough, they notice the big fuck off power plant with eight huge cooling towers in the background. But that's not what Eggborough people see. They see the sky. So what I'm asking you to do is to help me to produce a more accurate visual representation of how the houses in Eggborough would look if you actually lived here. I showed Mr. Fuller how you could use the history brush to wipe over the towers and replace them with blue sky. Excellent, Mr. Fuller said. How about I add something, I said. What were you thinking of? I was thinking of a rainbow. Mr. Fuller went to the window and looked out. I've seen rainbows in Eggborough, so it's possible. It wouldn't be a lie, but doesn't that mean it's been raining? No one wants to buy a wet house. You can have a rainbow and a blue sky, I said. Look, and I showed him what I'd done, a smudged arc of color shimmering. I enjoyed replacing the towers with rainbows, but after a few weeks got bored and began to add tiny unicorns as well, hidden in the dappled shadows of lawns. You could hardly see them, but I knew they were there. And every time I sneaked a unicorn into one of the photos, that house sold quicker than any of the others. I didn't tell Mr. Fuller. He was a practical man who liked to believe his achievements were down to human ingenuity. Magic had no place in the story of Mr. Fuller's success. Thank you. There might have been pictures of curling towers behind and houses, but the way Zoom works, it, it changes the exposure. So onto me, so you might not see all the detail. Right, the next story is called Soup and what it does to you. Slightly longer than usual. 
One day, Heidi decided that for the first time ever, she would read the label on her bottle of shampoo. It said that the shampoo was designed to give your hair more body. She picked up her ex-boyfriend's bottle, which he'd left there seven and a half months ago when they split up. This one said it was designed to make your hair less dry. That's when it struck her. Heidi ran a small artisan soup factory under the railway arches at Ancoats. Why couldn't she label her soup like shampoo? She could have soup to make you strong, soup to make you reflective, soup to make you dogged, soup to make you forceful, make you nonchalant, analytical, witty, soup to make you philosophical. No one would know what was in each soup and all the soups, although differently flavoured, would actually have the same effect, if soup can be said to have any effect at all, that is. She would pay for adverts for her new soup in a trendy magazine where people like her ex-boyfriend with his fixie and his beard would see them. And his friends would say, look at this cool idea, soup that says what it does, not what it is. And isn't that your ex-girlfriend's company? And he'd say, oh, yes. And then he would go quiet and think for a very long time before he took out his mobile phone. Thank you. I'll do a couple more. And then I think I'll have done my 20 minutes. Seeker lights. Mum and Trevor were getting serious. What with her new glittery top and the way she stroked the sleeve of his knobbly jumper like it was a hamster. But you can put up with that. When he bought me new trainers, my heart sank. The box declared in scrolly italics, Clark's. And when I lifted the lid, pink lights winked through tissue and my worst fears were confirmed. Seeker lights. A Nike copy with pathetic flashing bulbs in the heels. I was dead if I wore them like the boy who wore a Blue Peter t-shirt on non-uniform day and had since developed a stutter and started hanging with the science fiction lot. So I told Trevor about the nights my dad stayed over and Trevor stormed out, taking the shoes with him. My mum was insupportable, but relationships come and go. Your choice of trainer leaves an indelible mark. The room he was given had seven wardrobes, seven. At night, the wardrobes oppressed him, dark brooding figures shuffling closer to his bed, faces glowering out from the walls of polished grain. The landlord wouldn't let him get rid of them. They were classic, solid. So he had to think of a way to use them. The TV fitted into one, hi-fi in another, cooking equipment in a third, and various bits and bobs in the rest. But he couldn't think of anything to do with the last one. Then one night, he dragged his duvet into it and had the best night's sleep ever. He decided to stay in the wardrobe. He would move in a radio and would eat there too. Eventually, he would get six more people to live in the other wardrobes because he was the last person to keep himself to himself. Thank you. Normally I talk loads in between the stories and uh, chat about how they were written and things like that. But on Zoom at the minute, I can only see myself. <laughs> 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 so it's not, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel the same as when you're doing it live. Um, let's do um, this slightly longer one and then we'll finish. This one's called The Lost Language of Hair Grips. The tiny things she had. The tweezers, the eyelash curlers, the cuticle pushers, all of them so small, so brittle. That's what I miss most about Joanna, the little things. Not the little things she did or the little things she said, the actual little physical things she owned. Without Joanna's little things littering the place, everything looked giant. Overstuffed chairs, hulking shampoo bottles, 
breeze block soap. I possess nothing small enough to be mislaid, and this thought disturbed me, made me feel feline and uneasy. One night, I was rubbing one of Joanna's plastic hair grips against the cheese grater, sending orange plastic slithers spinning into my soup, when I realized this obsession was completely wrong. What I needed was some little things of my own. I discovered the answer in the aisles of the DIY store. Here were a billion little things for men to own and cherish. Curious devices like the discarded tools of a lost civilization. I filled my trolley and wheeled it to the checkout. But before I'd even paid, I met Pat. Pat had just one item in her trolley, a giant architectural plan. And following my eyes, she told me that there was nothing she hated more than little things. When her last fella brought home a pathetic little plastic man to wave at his toy locomotives, it was the last straw. There's something sinister, Pat explained to me in the car, about little things. I worry that they will divide and multiply in the night, creep inside me and possess me. You know where you are with a big thing. A big thing would never do that. I fell in love with Pat. Everything about her was big. Her house had huge bay windows like a comforting bosom into which I sank each night. I forgot completely about the little things. Think big, Pat said, and I did. This one's called Uncle Leonard. Leonard, Leonard, I'll start again. I like saying Leonard. <laughs> Leonard was famous for his skilled curation of Mossorama, a touring exhibition of moss from Darwin's collection. He was so obsessed with Mossorama, he would pose as a visitor and ask invigilators how it was doing. They would laugh and say, well, to be honest, we had high hopes but it seems nobody is excited by moss anymore. Leonard is 60 now, fat, diabetic, and addicted to flu strength paracetamol. He has no job, owns no property, and is well out of the moss world. Categorizing moss, he says, is a young man's game. Why doesn't he have a woman? He is funny, has teeth, hair, and a motorbike and is an expert on 1930s science fiction and moss. But who ever met a girl in the sci-fi section of a bookshop or at a moss exhibition? Sometimes you have to accept that no one will ever love you. That's a harsh ending, isn't it? I did consider reconsider that ending, but most people said, yeah, keep it in. It's what we need. So I'll, I'll do one more, but um, just to say, Thanks for having me at Milton Keynes. I think that's nearly my 20 minute slot. Um, we'll do some uh, Q A's at the end. Um, just to say, um, you can get some of my books if you want to read some of them stories that I've read. They're mostly on salt. Um, and also some of them have been combined into a graphic novel called The Three Rooms in Valerie's Head, which you can get. Um, it's published by Top Shelf in, in the States, but you can get it from um, Amazon and places like that. Um, so have a look at that if you're interested. So let me do as a final story, let's do this one called Everything in the Future Was As I Expected. No one had a job because everybody made their own things with 3D printers. Tweets could be turned into wearable jewelry and emotional data into liquid. The high street had died as had certain blue colored insects and saucers, but none were missed. A sought after delicacy was feral lamb. Farmers could make everything they needed with their 3D printers. So their neglected sheep skulked about the town with the urban otters eating out of bins. Hunted on quad bikes with crossbows and butchered with rusty saws in empty high rises, feral lamb was an exquisite meat with multi-layered notes of pepperoni and chip fat and the aroma of wet soil after a hurricane. You could plug yourself into a machine that made you think you were eating it, but it wasn't the same. 
Right, thank you very much, everyone. That's a load of flash fiction from me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. That was wonderful. And, and such a variety of content going on in such wonderfully brief pieces. Uh, we, I know we said at the start that, that we're going to take questions at the end and, and our lovely audience have been sending some great questions through. But I think their, their questions, it would be lovely to hear both your takes on. But one of the questions is very specific to one of David's stories. So if I can find Liz Milne somewhere here. Yes, I can, I can see you. Liz, I'm going to unmute you if you'd like to ask your question directly to David. Hi there, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, hi David, uh, it's the potato smile story. Um, I've, I've read it before and I always wonder where did you get the inspiration for that one? Potato smiles, there's a story behind that one actually. Um, I come from Cumbria and um, I, I don't know, there's a couple of Cumbrians on actually. And I was in a pub called the Kurt Style Inn at Lowe's Water, um, which was, was at the time owned by some really posh family in down south and this story so i was in there in the pub um eating some food and the the posh owners had come up to check on how the kirk style was doing um and see if they were doing a good job because they didn't run it themselves and they were going to order some food and um, they were sitting behind me and like all writers you eavesdrop and you listen to what they were saying and they had a look at the menu and they they said oh yes well i might have the um, i might have the rack of lamb and the other one and the, the the lady said well i might have rack of lamb but i'm interested in what these are these things here called potato smiles i've not heard of those and he didn't know what they were either and um she was looking at the children's menu i think by mistake and she's, <laughs> cause she ordered something something quite elaborate like rack of lamb with potato smiles and so she got them brought along and she loved it. Oh, the potato smiles with the rack of lamb went well. So I went off as, a, as you do with these notes and thought, how do I make a story out of it? And tried all kinds of different ways. Tried a couple of speak to each other with food. Maybe they use alphabetti spaghetti. They use potato smiles. They use other things. And I just tried everything. But in the end, I just had to throw them forward into the future. So I had this, um, this man well into the future just looking at his potato smiles after the relationship has ended. So um, the story about how the story was written is a bit more, is better than the story, actually. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John, is there a quick way we can unmute everybody and let David have a, a well-earned round of applause? mute <laughs> now i can unmute myself yes got it okay you can all Thank clap, you. You can all clap. <laughs> lovely <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> okay uh in which case on to our second reader this evening i'd better unmute her so that she's ready to start uh, and then mute everybody else. I can't see though, it's in front of Oh, because it's on the iPad. I can't see it. Well, I can turn it around now. Then I'm done. Uh, I'm Come on, Zoom, respond. Respond. Tanya, can you unmute yourself? Yes, you can. Lovely. Okay. okay. Okay, let me introduce for you Tanya Hirschman. Tanya left a career in science journalism for publications including Wired and New Scientist to become a writer, poet, teacher and editor. Her work includes three collections of flash fiction and short stories, poetry collections, uh, co-authoring the recently published On This Day She, uh, which features 366 stories of women throughout history. A number of hybrid works, including a memoir in college, partly inspired by being a writer in residence in a cemetery. And I think I'm going to have to ask about that later. Uh, Co-authoring a guide to writing short stories. Co-editing an anthology of stories inspired by the 100th birthday of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And founding Short St Stops, which is a website whipping up excitement about UK and Ireland short story activity. Uh, 
let me hand you straight over to the wonderful Tanya Hirschman. Take it away, Tanya. Thank you so much, Dave. Just to say, um, the On This Day She book isn't out yet, but is coming out on February 18th. So please right. do get excited and pre-order that. Okay. Um, um, it's, it's always funny when I get introduced and I'm listening to the introduction and thinking, gosh, that person's done all sorts of <laughs> things. And I'm like, oh my God, that's me. Um, that was such a joy listening to you, David. It was just such a pleasure to be reading with you. And I think we've, oh, we were talking about it. I think we've only ever read together once. But David's flash fictions were some of the earliest that I read, which really gave me permission to keep doing this thing and thinking that these tiny stories, there are places for them in the world. And David's stories are so great because you find yourself laughing and then thinking really deeply, like I'm still thinking about the seven wardrobes. Just love it. I think as well that if anyone wants to ask, we have both very different ways of writing our flash fictions. Um, so if anyone wants to ask that, uh, please do. And someone's just said, you want to put me on full screen. I think you can do that yourself, Helen. You just choose speaker view instead of gallery view. Um, yes, I do Zoom admin consultancy as well. Um, I'll get on with it now. Um, I was going to do a little bit of a sort of a whistle stop tour through my three collections. Oh, oh no, I'm spotlighted now. Great. Okay. It's weird seeing your own face very big. Okay. So I thought I'd do a little journey through my journey through flash fiction and also read a much newer story that isn't in one of the books. And in case you, I'm keeping an eye on the time as well, and in case you're interested in how I came to these tiny stories, I was trained as a journalist. And I think that my first degree was in maths and physics. And then I became a science journalist. But when I was being when I was doing journalistic training, that's where they first sort of filled me with this love for the very, very short, because when you're a journalist, you can never assume that someone's going to read all the way down your article. So you have to get as much as possible into as small a space as possible and grab their attention at the beginning. And it turned out this was a very useful skill also in fiction, which amazed me when I stumbled upon these tiny, tiny stories. And I thought I'd start with, I thought I'd read some ones I've not read before or not read for ages. And this is a story from my first collection, The White Road and Other Stories, which was also published by Salt, the same as David, in 2008. Um, and this story was sort of my second published flash story ever. It won second prize in a flash fiction competition, a 300 word competition, and I won 150 pounds and thought, that's not a bad rate per word, frankly. And I wanted to say as well that I uh, hadn't ever been to a pottery class before I wrote this. So whenever people say to you, write what you know, I'm not a fan of that, just make it up. So this is really long, I have to turn the page once. So this is called Mugs. They meet in pottery class. Her coffee mugs are misshapen, clumsy. His espresso cups are identical, boring. He envies her creativity. She craves his perfection. After class, they walk to the bus stop, shy, hands in pockets. Do you? Yes. I mean, are you? Am I hungry? They laugh, relieved. The air is warm with tomato sauce. They order gnocchi, spinach, ravioli. My mother wanted a boy, made me wear trousers when everyone else was in frilly dresses, she says after two glasses of house red. My brother shut me in the wardrobe for hours, he says, looking down at the plastic flowered tablecloth. She shifts her hand so her fingertips touch his, just for a second. At the end of the final class, they pack their work, carry heavy bags towards the bus stop. Hang on, he says. He steers her past and along to a dark alley beside the bank. Nervous, she follows. Putting down the bag, he gets out a parcel, unwraps the newspaper, then, like lightning, throws it at the wall. Bang! A thousand tiny white splinters. She stares, amazed, then laughs, laughs until she cries. He grins, watches as she scrambles to unwrap one of hers, and then... A bowler swings her arm and flings a shower of clay handles and coloured chunks. He throws another and then she, and they take turns until there is only one left of each. Please, she says. She takes his smooth espresso cup, cradling it. 
he holds her clumsy mug to his heart. They stand in a pool of pottery pieces in a dark alley, looking at one another in a city of a thousand sighs and lonely souls. Thank you. It's very nice to read the older stories. It's a bit like, I don't know if David feels like this, it's a bit like reconnecting with old friends because I wrote that 14 years ago. I also do pottery now, so it puts a different spin on the whole thing. I thought I'd read two, three in fact now from this, my second collection, which is, fit, my mother was an upright piano, which is 56 very short fictions. Um, and today, as some of you might know, today is the International Day to End Violence Against Women and Girls. So I thought I'd share this story, which I think I've never read out before. And it's called Colours Shift and Fade. He shouts, she shouts, the cat slinks under the sofa, the neighbour turns up the television, and finally they fall asleep. The baby is listening from his room and wondering what all the fuss is about. He is too new to know that this is not new, this is habit. He has only been in the world for four months and it has taken him a while to overcome his wonder at the surroundings. Now that he is older, he is registering events, processing them, distinguishing between his parents and others, between smells and noises and colours and where they come from. He knows that his walls are blue and his sheets are yellow and sometimes green. He doesn't have the names of the shades, of course, but he feels the differences. He knows that the cat doesn't like him, that he mustn't bite mummy when he breastfeeds, that daddy sometimes smells sour-ish in the mornings, and that when mummy cries, he mustn't join in because she cries harder and for longer and doesn't feed him. When daddy has gone and mummy takes him into the kitchen, sits at the table and lifts her shirt so he can feed, he looks up into her face. He sees the dark patch around one eye shift and change into purple, then green, then pink. Then one day there is a new patch on the other side of her face below the eye and that changes colours too. If he touches it with his hand, mummy twitches, says no, no baby and covers his fist in hers. And he knows that if he smiles at her after this, if he smiles at her any time daddy isn't there, she will stare at him for a moment and then slowly, slowly, her lips will move and she will do the same back to him. And then she will hold him so tightly and whisper into his ear, we'll leave next week, I'll pack and we'll go to grandma's. Don't you worry, my love. I'm just waiting for the right time. We'll go soon, soon, then everything will be all right. If you're wondering as well where some of these stories have come from it's quite hard to remember now um, but this next one which is the next one in the book called vegetable mineral it was written for a call for submissions i think for short stories inspired in some way by games and i ended up with two in this book one inspired by monopoly which is later in the book and this one uh, <clears throat> and sometimes that's all i needed as a prompt someone tells me something i have the first line and then the story sort of bursts forth and this is, I don't even need to say this anymore, it's quite strange. So this is called Vegetable Mineral. I said, vegetable. Turnip, you said? Nope, ask a question. Are you a root vegetable? No, I said, ask again. Are you in salads, you said? That depends, I said. Depends on what? On what you like to put in your salad. I lay on the sofa. You lay on the floor, your head by my feet. Are you chalk? I said. Chalk isn't a mineral, you said, blowing on your fingers. It's calcium, I said. So? So, that's a mineral. No, it isn't. Of course it is. I got up, one of my feet slapping you on the ear as I walked over to the window. Do you think if we had jobs, it would be better? You asked from the floor. I hummed something which was supposed to be our love will keep us warm baby but halfway through I couldn't remember if that was actually a song or something I'd invented. What? You said. I'll put the kettle on, I said. When you came back with the post you held the letters out to me as if the red ink would burn through you like acid. Let's run away, I said. Barbados, Brighton, Bermuda, Brooklyn. Only bees, 
he said and slumped on the couch. Today is brought to you by the letter B, I said. Animal, you said. Domesticated, I said as I shoved the bills down the back of the armchair. Depends, you said. Depends on what? If you could be bothered domesticating it. Has anyone, I said, what? Ever domesticated it? How the fuck should I know, you said, and you made movements with your hands, fluttering them in and out that could have meant anything on any day in any country in the world. We went out that night, you in my old jeans, me in your old tracksuit trousers, your arm through mine, five pounds in a pocket. We shared a half pint of something hopeful and sat in the corner. Does it eat other animals, I said. Yes. Okay, well that's something. Ten more questions. I took a sip, then slid the glass towards you. I might do it, I said, looking out of the window at the rain hovering above the pavement. Don't, you said. I can't share half pints and trousers with you forever. Okay, here's a freebie. Sometimes it has a tail, sometimes it doesn't. It wouldn't be so bad. He wouldn't be such a nightmare boss. I mean, what worse can he do to me now that he didn't do when I was a kid? The one with a tail, it can have 12 babies at a time. I mean, they're not called babies, but if I told you what they were called, that'd give it all away. If you sell your soul, can you buy it back later, even if it costs more, I said, and let that hang in the air while the half pint got warmer. The first day I came home and you weren't on the sofa and you weren't in the bedroom. The bathroom door was locked. Come out, I said. I'm not a monster, just a working stiff. Animal, you said from inside. Only if you come out. Animal, I heard you sniffle, or it could have been a train. Fuck, come on, how long have you been in there? Animal. I went to put the kettle on. When it boiled, I took our mugs and stood outside the bathroom door. Animal, I said. Silence. Finally, long haired? No, I said and sat down with my back against the door. I felt you on the other side, the ridges of our spine sinking into the plywood. Yours? No. African? Could be. I blew on the two T's. I sucked in my breath and thought that maybe I could hear you sucking in yours. I sat there with your mug and my mug. I imagined zebras, antelopes, wildebeest, mother lions and lion cubs. I pictured you teaching the lion cubs party tricks wearing my trousers. Domesticated, I said, and held both mugs up to my face, watching the way the dust motes danced through the steam and twirled around in the last of the afternoon light. I'm trying to think how many more I can read. Um, that one was slightly longer than I thought. No, I'm going to read another. I'm going to read one more from this book, a tiny one. Um, someone said, I have these wonderful blurbs. Oh, I've got a blurb from David Gaffney, which I'd forgotten about. Had these wonderful blurbs um, that sort of talked about that the stories are mostly about miscommunication and communication. And I guess that was what um, I was thinking of. That was preoccupying me when I was writing these things. What happens in the space between two people? So this is really on that same theme. This is a tiny one, it's half a page. It's called That Small, Small Inch. You thought it was the oddest setting. You thought it was the strangest place to meet, a phone box. I said, I'm very fond of this one. You looked at me like that again. Don't look at me like that, I said back to you. My nose an inch from yours inside this joyful phone box. I did grin then to demonstrate that this was fun, a date. You didn't grin right back as if you thought, oh no, one of these spirits has gone inside her. What will she do now and next and after that and me here just a small, small inch away? I heard you think that, really I did. We were pressing stomach to stomach. Feel it, I said to you then and then my hunger made itself too clear. You did smile then and reached your hand across that inch and put it on my tummy. Does your phone box have coffee or cake? You said then, but your fingers on my cardigan, which was only millimeters from the skin below had sent me flapping all of me and every warmth, a spark, a burst of red delight that I could no longer talk. 
I looked it into you instead, looked my words into your eyes and then, oh then you heard it clear and crossed that small, small inch once more, this time with your mouth. So we're moving, thank you, we're moving on. I'll read two more um, in the remainder of my time, it should be fine. I thought I'd read, I'm gonna finish with a story from my third collection, um, but I'm gonna read you a brand, a newish one first. And part of the reason I wanted to read it to you is because um, I'm the judge for this round of the Reflex Flash Fiction Competition, and it closes in five days on November 30th. So I wanted to encourage you, if you are writers of flash fiction, please send your story in. And the reason that I'm gonna read this is because my story won second prize in one of the earlier rounds of Reflex Flash Competition. They do it quarterly about six months ago. So I thought that would remind me to remind you, say, please send me your stories. And it's the word limit is between 180 and 360 words. So huge, huge. And this is called Get Gone. Get gone, girl, she snarls. And the girl, who never knows what she might be getting, goes. Galloping across roads, the girl feels herself small, feels herself dissolving. Giant clouds at the level of her shoulders try to make her laugh, but the girl is not amused. Get gone, she says herself to the clouds and to the snails that line the way, watching. Girls and snails never mix. This she knows from early on. Gathered into herself later, after a day or week, she sits fed and small and almost but not dissolved. Girls so easily disappear. She lost several and has had to keep herself withstanding. Gently, says a voice from besides, and the girl does not need to turn to know it is the one who often comes at this point. Gentle, she says to the voice, is not how I am feeling. Get yourself there, says the one who has no body. Go away, all of you, telling me what, where and how. Good, whispers the voice, so soft the girl almost unhears it. Good for you, girl. Girls become not girls, and how they are then depends some on how they were spoken to, and some on how they choose to allow themselves to speak and be spoken of. Gone are the days of girls mapping onto just one way, and our girl knows that where there is a fork, she must decide. Growling softly, our girl, who has grown much further from the snails, much closer to the clouds, meanders up to that first roadway split. Give me an indication, she asks the clouds, but they who had tried to amuse her now are uninterested. Give me some help, she says to the snails, but they make as if they can't hear her. Glancing down one way, then down the other way, our girl puts out her foot, withdraws, turns, then turns again. Get gone, girl, she says to herself, takes a step and another step, and there she is. We can see her striding. We watch her leap away. Good, we say. Good for you, girl. Oh, quick bit of very cold herbal tea now. Um, thank you, Dave, for putting the Reflex Fiction link in there. Check it out, send me your stories. And they don't have to be anything like my stories. I love reading all sorts of things. Surprise and delight me. I'm going to end now, and I might go two minutes over, <clears throat> with a story I love ending on. And it's the last story in this collection some of us glow more than others and many of these stories were inspired by the year I spent as writer in residence in a biochemistry lab and a lot of stories of my career has been a lot of, I've had a lot of stories on the radio and that's been fantastic so this was a story commissioned for me to write for the radio um, and it should take about six minutes and when it was broadcast on the radio we broadcast it with sound effects so even though I can't hear you do feel free to join in and you will know where to join in it's called The Party. We get to the party. We say hello to our hosts. We take off our coats. The party is crowded. We fight our way through to the kitchen. We load our plates with food. We sit in a corner. There are a lot of people. 
There are mathematicians and physicists, experimentalists and theoreticians. There is an elderly but still lively Nobel Prize winner. We are not mathematicians. We are not physicists. When someone asks what we do, we swallow our food and we say, biochemists. They are polite, they nod, but they change the subject. They talk about a film they have seen or about the decor of the kitchen. We nod, we talk politely too, even though we have not seen that film. At a certain point, there is music, quite loud, from the other room. We place our plates on the side and move into the hallway. We see people dancing, mathematicians, physicists, theoreticians and experimentalists, and the elderly but still lively Nobel Prize winner. We look at each other and then we sneak up the stairs. We find the room where the coats are kept and we sit on the bed. We hold hands. We hear someone coming up the stairs. We wonder about hiding, but it is too late. She comes into the room. Here they are, she calls to someone behind her. Come, she says, come. And she takes our hands, pulls us up from the bed. We look at each other. We do not understand, but she gives us no choice. Here they are, she cries as she leads us back down the stairs. I have them, she says, as she pushes us gently into the other room where the music is loud, where everyone is dancing. Someone turns down the music and everyone is looking at us, swaying and smiling. They open up a space and there we are in the middle of the room, surrounded by everyone smiling, swaying. We look at each other, we grip hands, we do not understand. The woman who has brought us down here, who took us from the coat room and brought us says, will you please, please give us some, some of your words, your biochemistry words. And the others, the mathematicians and the physicists, the experimentalists and the theoreticians, the elderly Nobel Prize winner, they are all nodding, saying, yes, yes, give us your words, your words. We are shy. We are holding hands in the middle, the music still playing, everyone swaying. We look at each other. We wait. Is this real, we think? Do they really want this? And then we do it. We begin, we say, DNA. DNA, they all say, DNA, DNA. Then we say, lymphocyte. Ooh, they say, and they repeat the word. Lymphocyte, they say, turning to one another, still swaying. Lymphocyte, organelle, we say then. And then lamellopodia. Lamellopodia, they cry, and someone raises up her arms. The woman who brought us here took us from the coat room, claps her hands. Lamellopodia, she cries. We look at each other. We smile a little. We loosen our handhold. Then we say, green fluorescent protein. Oh my, says the elderly Nobel Prize winner, and he does a twirl, and then says green fluorescent protein. The words ripple round the room until everyone is whispering them, chanting them, green fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein, and the chant becomes louder and louder. Someone turns the music up and then everyone is dancing. We stand in the middle of the sea of dancing mathematicians and physicists, experimentalists and theoreticians, and the twirling elderly Nobel Prize winner, listening as they murmur green fluorescent protein as they sway and dip. We stand and we smile, we smile and smile. We feel wanted, we feel loved, we feel heard. Thank you. I will finish oh. there. Yeah. And I'm going to unmute you all so that you can give Tanya a well-deserved round of applause. You should all slowly be unmuting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Tanya, I can see from the chat that we have three or four people that have been putting forward questions as, as we've been going through that I'm going to have put... Have we lost Dave again? Uh, I think he's still there further down the screens. I, yeah, no, he's still with us. Dave, he's still with us. David. Oh, there you are. Right, OK. Yeah, I'm still here. It's just Good. Right. There you are. Good. I can see you now. I have one question which I was going to ask of, of Tanya. Uh, 
partly triggered by the last story that you read, but also by the very first time that I heard you read, which was at the launch of one issue of Ambit, where you read a, a wonderful story about a nun that really wanted a microscope. Yes, uh, who sets up a biochemistry lab in the convent yes. called Glows, yes. yeah. Yeah, absolutely loved the story. But something that struck me about your writing is a lot of it, I mean, it's, presumably it's partly your professional background, but a lot of your, your stories are about science or about scientists. And that strikes me as very unusual in a, in a modern fiction setting. Uh, do you want to talk about, uh, however broadly you want to address that, that point, please um, feel free. Well, um, it's, yeah, I have a background in science, in maths and physics, which I was very bad at. And then I became a science journalist. So I spent 13 years writing about science. Um, and so although I was really bad at science, I I've always been absolutely fascinated by it. And so it made sense to me, even though I'd never read any science fiction, that was not part of my reading as a child. I thought science, there's so much fascinating stuff here that can be used as inspiration for stories. And so for my first collection, half the stories are inspired by new scientist articles. And then when I, I was living abroad, I was living in the Middle East at the time. And then when I moved back to the UK, I thought, instead of writing inspired by articles about science, why don't I go to the source and hang out with scientists? And so I spent that year as a writer in residence in the biochemistry lab. And it it's still having, that was, that was um, about 10 years ago, and it's still rippling through my writing. And there are stories that I know that don't have any science overtly in them that I know came the genesis of them was from my time in the lab because there was so much there about, you know, what can we see? What can't we see? What do we know? Um, the nature of reality. And I just absolutely loved it. But I think actually there's a lot more of this going on that you might be aware of. Um, I know quite a few people with a science background who are writing these kind of science inspired fictions. And I have a friend, this is a great segue and you didn't even know you're setting yourself up. <laughs> My friend Pippa Goldschmidt with whom she's also, a, uh, she has a PhD in astronomy. I mean, she's a serious scientist. She and I co-edited uh, co the anthology inspired by Einstein's general relativity. And now we're co-writing an anthology, just the two of us of stories and hybrid pieces inspired by women in science. So actually there's a lot going on and and there's a there's a couple of brand new magazines that are looking for exactly this so there's a magazine called seisma s-e-i-s-m-a that's a new art science magazine and there's another magazine that i just sent something to today called tamarind which is looking for stories inspired by science and science and society so there's a lot of it out there um and there's quite a few people doing it and understanding that you don't need to understand the science to plunder it for its riches. And I run workshops quite often. And in fact, another segue, Dave, you'll have to shut me up at some point. <laughs> but, but I'm running a four week online workshop in April, especially called Science Flavoured Writing, where we're gonna be using science as inspiration for short stories, poetry, creative nonfiction, hybrid, anything you want. So I like to encourage people to do what I've done and steal from science. Good, good on you. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, while you and David are answering other people's questions. I will look at the links for Seisma and Tamarind and I'll stick them in the chat for people. Uh, I'm going to set you up with a, a, a question. Shauna Robertson has uh, said in the chat, uh, I'm intrigued by Tanya's comments about your very different writing processes. So I'm going to let you and David uh, talk about that to our lovely audience for a few minutes while I go and research those URLs to share with people. David, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I often do uh, writing workshops about flash fiction. And um, I always talk about my techniques and Tanya's techniques, because I use Tanya's short fiction uh, on, the, on the course. And I always say, jump in if this is wrong, Tanya. I always say, if Tanya's writing a 300 word story, she writes 300 words. That's what she does. But when, when I'm writing a two or 300 word story, I'll write, say that's, do you remember that story I read about Uncle Leonard and his moss and all of that? That, that story was 2000 words originally. So it was 2000 words all finished and everything about the, the backstory about Leonard, what else he'd done, the things he'd got up to and all of that. But I start really long 
maybe a thousand words, two thousand even at the extreme, and cut it down and keep cutting it down till I can find what I think is the the kernel of the story. So it's quite a a wasteful resource, a waste of resource. The way I do things, I do write big and then go short. Now and again, I go back to the longer story, but not always. They just sit there. Um, I think you're different, Tanya, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I tend to have a sort of natural length that I write to, or I get a feeling for how long it's going to be when I start. And so it just tends to come out at about three, 400 words. So yeah, I think I don't do that same editing process. But then again, I think, and I, probably you agree with me, David, not every writer doesn't just have one writing process. I very often will say what I think my writing process is, and then the next week it'll be something completely different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful or not helpful at all, since we all do it differently. <laughs> That's a kind of related question uh, that uh, Bjorn F. Grave, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Bjorn, uh, to, uh, which you typed in as a, as a question for David, but I guess you can both have a stab at. Uh, and I'd be interested too. I'm, I'm a short story writer, but my idea of short is two and a half, three thousand words. So 400 is just, what? Uh, Bjorn, but Bjorn's question was, how do you decide if a flash should be a, a short piece of around 150 words as opposed to a longer piece of around 350 words? Uh, I love that 350 is a longer piece. Yes. <laughs> so long, really long. Um, um, I, well, I'll just grab that. I'll jump in there and then David can jump in there. But there's no real deciding for me. Um, for me, the way I work is I try and keep my logical mind entirely away from anything. Um, writing poetry tends to be different. Writing poetry for me is more like solving a crossword puzzle. But when I'm writing fiction, I try and shut off my very active thinking, logical brain. So there's no deciding and there's no kind of moment. Um, it, it just, I let the story tell me what it needs. And that sounds kind of weird and maybe a bit mystical. And I think it's because I've been doing it for 20 years. I kind of have a trust in it. Each time you're coming to it new, but I think that that I have experience now in finishing things and that is what helps me trust that something will happen and it will go somewhere. So it tends to tell me what length it needs and sometimes it needs longer and sometimes it takes much, much longer. And I spent two and a half years once on an 800 word story. Wow. Um, so it's really for me, the story tells me how long it wants to be. Um, and sometimes I go, there is a story I've only once been told um, when I've submitted a flash fiction story and the publication accepted it and then said, could you add a little bit more? And that's, that, so I went slightly even more minimalist, but it's also so much about the kind of stories you want to write. I love minimalism. I love to read stories that leave huge gaps for the reader to fill in. So that's the kind of stories I like to write, but there is no set length. And like Dave said at the beginning, flash fiction, if it's defined as anything, Americans think of it as up to 1500 words and short stories themselves can be 10, 15,000. So it totally depends on what you want the story um, to be, really. I feel like very unhelpful when I do these things because I'm a fan of, there are no rules. Sorry. <laughs> I think no, that's fine, me too. Oh, Sorry, David. I would say it's always worth, um, I'd, I'd write a longer story sometimes and finish it, but then I, I think as an experiment, I think, I wonder if I could get it down to 500 words. I wonder if it's possible. And it's it's just interesting to do that. And then if you do get it down to 500, they don't think, I wonder if you could get it down to 250 words. So you, it's, a, it's just an interesting experiment. I and mean, if you do it as an experiment, then you look and think, well, actually it does work as a really short piece, but also, the longer pieces allow people more time to spend in the world that you've created, don't they? And I think people do quite like to be in a, a longer piece. So sometimes I've, I've workshop stuff with people in writing groups and they've said, oh, why did you cut that out? That bit, I like that, in that bit where you, you explain things and I've actually axed it out of the story and left it. So as ever, Tanya and I provide no answers <laughs> only, only descriptions of how we work. We are just gaps, basically. <laughs> gaps. Yeah. Kind of, kind of a follow-on question for me uh, there. Um, 
something that that strikes me about writers is i think we we tend to fall into two camps there are the people that love the the producing the first draft and the people that that love the taking that draft they hated every second of trying to bloody finish and then polishing it finally till they're actually happy with it um like tanya i i, I kind of came to writing fiction from journalism and copywriting so I had this kind of thing in my head where it's, I need a brief. What am I trying to achieve here? Right, I've got a brief, right, I can start now. Uh, but I love the editing process. It's, it's the, the, the buffing and polishing and making all the decisions about whether that needs to stay or get expanded or, or whatever. The actual writing process, it's, it's like an un, unanesthetized dentistry to me. I, I really dread the idea of, of trying to finish a draft. How does that play out for each of you? I, I always dread the the question when somebody says, what, what were you trying to do here? Because <laughs> what mostly what writers don't start out with, they just start out as more of an investigation or an inquiry and a research and they keep writing and find out what's there. And then when somebody looks at it and says, what are you trying to do? Uh, I think it's it's difficult. It's a bit like if you look at song songwriting's interesting from that. I always think about what the guy who wrote um, the Wichita Line Man, which is a, a, a great song, uh, which everybody knows, and people always uh, say to him, you know, what were you trying to do with Wichita Line Man? What are you trying to say? And he said, well, you know, they just asked me to write a place song. They said, people have had hits with 24 Hours to Tulsa, and by the time I get to Phoenix, just write us a song about a place. So he wrote this song, which is unfinished, the lyric about Wichita, Wichita and the line man and all of that, with, with nothing particularly there that, that, that he intended to mean. But then the, the song, the way it works with people, it works really profound in a way. And, and if you said to him, well, what were you trying to do? He wouldn't really been able to say. Does that help? Yeah. Um, I like that very much. This is why I, I point blank refuse to tell anyone what I think my own stories are about, because once it's out there, it's not up to me anymore. And I love hearing what people think it's about. And I've learned to, to make my face very neutral because sometimes people say things and I'm thinking, what? That's not my story. But, <laughs> neutral. but in terms of your question, Dave, as well, I am the opposite of you in that I love the writing because for me, I'm telling myself a story and I am my first reader and I absolutely love it. And it's really, it's my imaginary friends in my head. Um, and if I'm not keeping myself sufficiently entertained, then there's no way, you know, that, that that's sort of my baseline. So I love it. I love the writing. And I don't really tend to do that, get the first draft down and in it's sprawling and then edit it into something. I tend to more write a little bit, then I stop. And I've learned over the years as well that waiting for me, waiting is a really important part of the writing process. That it, because if I don't wait at a certain point until I know where the story's going, then it's not the story telling itself, it's me pushing something. And I can feel the difference now after all these years. Yeah. So that's what it is for me. It's just like a sort of self version of Jack and Ori. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is all really. Um, especially now I've been writing poetry for the last couple of years I've got so excited about poetry because I used to hate it and then I finally understood what the line break could be and so I've been writing loads of poetry but then I gave my second poetry collection into my editor about six months ago and suddenly all I wanted to write is fiction and short stories I wanted to get back to my imaginary <laughs> friends and get back to my characters and so it's just lovely I feel like maybe there's something about the times we're living in now where you need imaginary friends and you need a bit of escapism. I can't write poems at all right now. Um, so, so yeah, different, a different experience. I hear a lot of people who hate the writing, the first mm. draft and love the editing. So each to their own. We, we have a follow up related question uh, on this editing and cutting uh, from Jill Abram. Uh, let me unmute Jill. Does Jill want to be unmuted? Yeah, here I come, here I come. <laughs> Hello. Jill, Hang on, let me work. find my camera button as well. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Uh, lovely readings. Um, and my question um, is probably more for David because he said he writes big and cuts down. 
Um, do you ever worry that you're going to leave something out that's vital to the um, story because you know it because you've written it and you've forgotten it when you've when you've taken it out that other people don't know it? Yeah, I, I do. I do worry about that actually because there's been some examples where I've shown people the longer version and and they've said, "Oh God, you shouldn't." I'll give you an example of one that I read earlier on. I don't know if you remember. I read a story. Um, where the uh, the guy throws a vase and um, towards the girlfriend as a test to see what a personality is like, and um, and and as it happens, she just watches the vase and lets it drop and smash on the ground. And um, so I had two versions of it. I had one version where which is the one you heard, which is the one where he says. It will tell you if she believes in spontaneity. It will tell you if she believes in God, in, in fate, and it will tell you all these things. But in the version I ended up with, there was none of that in, in there. It was just through throwing the vase, and she didn't catch it, and it landed, and it smashed. And I said, well, that's, people will get all the rest <laughs> from, from that. And, and someone said to me, well, not really, David. They're not going to get all that that you've cut out. It's better to have it in. So it does, there is a definite danger that you can cut out what what really people are going to enjoy. Um, and I'm, I am aware of that, but I don't know whether I'm always the best judge of it. So do you think it's important then to have an editor who can look over that? I think now and again, if you're unsure, it's worth having someone else because you know so much about it and you're forever taking all the scaffolding away and taking things away that that, that you think it doesn't need and then that the, you might take some of the way that maybe it does. So, yeah, I think it's useful to have, to be part of some kind of writing group or give somebody stuff to read. And if they're saying, I'm not quite getting that gap, I'm not quite getting why the character does that, you can go back and look at it again because, yeah, you can edit too much. Well, like, like that story I talked about that was published in Smoke Long last year where... It was very minimalist, but it was so minimalist that they asked me to put in a little bit more. And yeah, that was yeah. absolutely useful. That hasn't happened very often. And I tend not to share my work in progress with anyone because also I know you've got to share it with the kinds of people that are the readers that you are aiming at as well. Um, but, but editors of literary magazines who want to make suggestions, absolutely. But sometimes I'll say, no, I don't want to tell you that. And mm. they can't have it. I, I think the problem is, well, problem, is that over the years I've had stuff published that's very minimalist and very weird and so it's given me permission to keep doing the minimalist weird stuff and just be like you know I'm sorry it's not my job to, to mm -hmm. fit it for you. <laughs> Quite stroppy now. <laughs> <laughs> what was in that herbal tea? It's just I have no fennel. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. No I mean stroppy in general as a writer it's right. like yeah this is it, it's most of the time I'll be like this is how I want it. But every now and then an editor will say something. I'll be like, oh gosh, yeah, you're completely right. Yeah. Oh Jesus, that was a good question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Speaking of which, we had a lovely question from a lady called Fiona, who I've just messaged privately to say, would you like to ask your question about dialogue and narrative? And she hasn't responded. But Fiona, if I unmute you, would you would you like to ask that? Some people maybe yes. don't want to speak and yes no that's fine oh you do hello hi oh, hello. Um, i'm trying to think what the question was i think it was just about they can't remember the wording but um how do you balance do you find it difficult to balance both of either of you um dialogue with narrative in flash fiction pieces gosh i don't i um, don't really know how to answer that I, I, I do think about that quite a lot because I, I judge quite a lot of flash fiction competitions and read. So that's when I read a lot of flash fiction. And I, I think about it when I'm writing it. And I, I tend to be on the, the, the side where I feel that dialogue doesn't work so well in flash fiction. If it's very, very short, I tend to think that it's always worth rewriting it without the dialogue, see what it looks like. And sometimes it can work better um, really short flash fictions of a couple of hundred words with sort of fairly staccato dialogue, you know, underneath each other. Um, I don't know. I'm not, there's something about it that for me personally doesn't work as well. What do you think, Tanya? Um, 
Um, I was just thinking how much dialogue there was in all the flashes that I've just read out. I'm like, oh God. Um, I, I, once again, I'm just like, it's whatever the story, the particular story needs. So that story, Vegetable Mineral, that I read you, was almost all dialogue. Um, and then some of the other stories are no dialogue at all. And it just, it really, mm. just, for me, it just totally depends on what the story needs. I love dialogue in part because you might have noticed that a lot of the time when I include dialogue, I never have people finishing their sentences. And I really love that because I feel like this is what people do in real life. And I think I write dialogue because it helps me, firstly, it helps me hear the voices of my characters. It helps me get to know them. And whenever people send me work for critique, quite often one of my main comments is, I cannot hear your character. Um, and there are no scenes. There is no, they, there's no scenes where they're having conversations with anyone else and, and writing a scene, even if you don't end up using it, can really help you begin to hear their unique voice so i'm a big fan of voice um in short stories of whatever length so i'm a big i i do like dialogue but it totally depends completely depends on the story once again refusing to make grand pronouncements but anyway uh. <laughs> in, in which case let me cue you up your your next topic to refuse to make grand pronouncements about again for both of you and i'm going to hand the microphone to phil charter phil take it away yeah hi guys um thanks for the readings uh i wanted to ask about how you or if you vary the tone of the stories in your collections if you think about if sometimes they are all too negative um it's a, a how, how question. I'm happy to jump in there um, and we can both talk about it because I'm really intrigued to hear what David thinks. But um, my my collections were put together from basically all the stories I'd written at the time and they were just all shoved in together and putting them in order, like putting a poetry collection in order is really hellish and it's better if someone else does it. But that said, I have never worried that, that anything I've written has been too negative or too positive even. I've never worried that it's been, I learned a while ago because I did a lot of, um, I do a lot of readings and performance and I think I did feel pressured at the beginning to read stories that were in some way uplifting that would make people laugh. But then I understood that so that audiences also like to be moved and be made to think and that you can really you can read darker stories to an audience and you can just feel them listening um and also it's it it really um ties into my thing about when a story when your work is out in the world you have no control over how it's going to be received and your story will be seen perhaps as dark and disturbing by one person and hysterically funny by another person. And I have had this experience so many times. I've had the experience where I've been reading something at a, an event, which I thought was very deep and moving and someone will burst into hysterical laughter. So you just, it, for me, it's all about letting go of how any reader might read it. And just finding some way in the collections um, I, I, I the, my third collection, I grouped, there's so many stories because so many of them are tiny. I sort of grouped them into sets according to some vague theme or something and just wanted to have them in some way speak to each other. And I like that a collection for me is these all these stories that have been published individually. What do they do when they're between the covers of the book? What kind of conversation can they have with each other that they it, that's different from how they were out a single individual stories in the world but really I try not to worry much at all um, and I think that comes from experience for me I've managed and it's astonishing and I never thought I'd get to this I've managed to get rid of my inner voice my inner critic and I have no inhibitions anymore when it comes to fiction writing um, which is amazing and I think that's something that's come from doing it for a long time when I first started writing poetry a few years ago whole new inner critic saying don't be stupid that's not a poem so I realise it's not a general thing. It's just so far, it's just with the short stories and it's getting, he's getting quieter with the poetry now as well. Uh, David. I, I would say that trying to think about the question, most of my 
most of my stuff is generally quite quite down and quite um, is is not celebratory or or happy in in any way. It generally, even it might be funny, but it's it's never in a positive way. I would say, uh, not that I go out to to write it like that. That's just how it ends up. But I never write anything. I'd find it very difficult. I've had the odd commission where somebody has been who wants you to write something celebratory, you know, and I could never do the sort of writing job where somebody says, write a poem about Manchester and, and how brilliant Manchester is or a short fiction about that. I could never write that. And the ones that I've been given to write, I've been given a couple. I think the the person commissioning them has been generally a bit disappointed because I've been I've never approached it in a kind of a, a, a cynical way, not cynical, but a way of thinking about it in a, in, a, in a more complex way than simply um, trying to celebrate something. So I, I find it, yeah, most most of my stuff would generally be be on the downward slope. Um, I, I do group the. The, the last short fiction collection I had out, More Sawn Off Tales, I did group all the fiction together, uh, but you, you might not be aware of it if you read it, but the, it's, in, it's in groups of three. And the first, sec, the first stories are about um, people trying to, people without relationships looking for a relationship. The next ones are about people in relationships, but generally not happy. And the last ones are about people who've left relationships who are not happy. So there's, there's a, <laughs> no one's there's a, happy. <laughs> and, and they work in these groups of three throughout the book. And then the other category of stories that I have when I ordered them all out, bear in mind with flash fiction, you've got 60 odd stories. So when I, the other section was, I think the section was called just weird. <laughs> and they were the just weird ones that were kind of didn't fit in those. But most of them fitted in those relationship ones where you were kind of one or the other. You were looking or within or leaving. And um, it gave it a kind of pattern. Of, but un unhappiness is much more fun, I think. <laughs> and being miserable. <laughs> I, 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 I think anyway. I think that maybe your stories like mine. I've decided that my fictions are mostly tragically optimistic or optimistically That's tragic. Right. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's reassuring, Phil, if you write a lot of, you know, dark <laughs> fiction. <laughs> OK, a, a very different question from uh, somebody else in our audience called B, which she's addressed to David saying, I noticed that you haven't done any Zoom workshops, which are a lifeline for people that can't attend them in person. <laughs> but I'm going to make it a question for both of you. Uh, do you have any plans uh, for any online workshops? Uh, Asking for a literature festival in Milton Keynes, in brackets, he said at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. David? I'd, I'd be happy to do workshops on Zoom. I, mean, um, I haven't done because nobody asked, asked me, but um, now I probably would try. Uh, I must admit, I, I do enjoy sitting in a room with, with people around a table and, and enjoying the, the interaction. Um, so there's something about it that doesn't, that, that there's a level of it that doesn't appeal, but, but if that's where we are, I'd be happy to do something and try um, and see how it went, but I haven't done anything. Tanya, you probably have done something on Zoom, have you? Yeah, I've been, I mean, I was saying to Dave and John before this event that I never would have imagined that I would like doing this, this kind of online I'm not a phone person. I never thought I'd like this video conferencing, but I actually have really taken to it. And I've been running a, a monthly um, in-person workshop here in Manchester. And so we moved that, I moved that onto Zoom right when lockdown started. Um, and so I was teaching that until July and then I stopped to have a break. I've taught two Arvon Zoom masterclasses, which are very interesting because they have several hundred people all over the world and everyone's on mute and all their video screens are off. And so someone said it's a bit like Tanya TV, but they get very, <laughs> they get very excited in the chat box. So I actually love doing that. And I'm doing a lot of online teaching, non-Zoom online courses as well. And, it, and I've got, I'm teaching a flash fiction course right now for the second time. And I'm doing all these online courses either through Arvon or through something called the London Lit Lab. And so I've got a load more courses coming up next year, the science one that I mentioned, and hopefully I'm going to be doing another Arvon masterclass 
or two. So that should be really fun. So I've really <laughs> taken to it. Oh, I, I love really it. Done for it. Tanya. I have. I had. I have. Would have in there. I wouldn't I, have I thought it. My day. I, I, in my day job, I've spent all day on. You Jesus actually have a day Jesus. job, though. I have a day job, so I, I do that. So oftentimes when someone says, do you want to do summer on Zoom <laughs> in your private like, life? No. Then they say, oh, God, I'd rather not. I'd rather go to the park and meet you there. <laughs> Maybe we can do. Well, Are we allowed that, to do workshops know, in, in the park with groups of six people? In the winter? In the benches? Could we do that? Could do that I'd, if you brought your own heating. I'd be happy to do it in the park. I will. I might be starting doing my monthly workshops again on Zoom from January, but I can't. Also, Zoom is exhausting. It's kind of more exhausting than being in person, and you don't. You have to bring your own cake. Um, but but keep an eye if you're interested. Oh, thank you, B. That's very very nice. B. She David. She really wants you to do one. So I think that's it's something you should try because it, it just like two hours. And, and it, it, it really uplifts me as well as completely exhausting me. Well, I'm happy to do it if somebody asks me. I'm well, you do one just for B. Okay. But if keep an eye on my website, if anybody wants to see what I've got coming up, I'll put that in the chat box. Whoa, hang on. Sorry, I'm scrolling. We've, we've got so much happening in the chat as we've been talking. A question for from Mildred uh, for David. Hello, David. Mildred here in Germany. I read Son of Terz last year, and one of my favourite stories was A Good System. What inspired you to write it? And also for you, what was the advantage of writing stories during commute compared to however you did it before? Um, a Good System, that's it that's for everyone else. That's a short story. I think it's the one that's set in a cafe where... Um, a woman walks up to a, a random woman, walks into the cafe, sees a man, she's clearly got some problem, walks up to him and punch, punches him. <laughs> <laughs> and then goes out of the cafe. Um, and that's what the, the story's about. And the good system refers to the system of, do you know in cafes where they have to give you a number that you put on your table <laughs> with, <laughs> and, and you put it on the table and it tells you what your order is and that's what the words a good system uh, uh, stands for but the story came from it just happened all my stories come from real stuff generally I'm sure Tanya's the same that I just see happening I don't tend to write from prompts the the, the prompts that I have are the bits of paper in my pocket about the things I've seen and the things that have happened in the day when I'm out and about on trains and wandering around and I was in the cafe it, uh, it's a posh department store. I'm not often in the in um, Manchester called Kendall's. Is it Kendall's? Yeah, Kendall's Cafe. I was sitting in there, and um, just a, a man was with his family, his children, and what looked to be his wife sitting having a meal. And a woman who was very well dressed in a fur coat, looking very glamorous, just walked in, saw him there, walked over and punched him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I don't have to make anything up. It just happens, <laughs> and I just wrote it down. And uh, it might have been entirely innocent, but that's what happened. And uh, that's what a good system came, came from. Um, so most of my stories come, come from that. Um, I was going to, but in, interestingly, as you do, you change, don't you? How you do that? I tend to write down unusual stuff and weird things I see and things I hear people say. But I was reading an essay by Lydia. Davis, which is really interesting Great. about writing, which is really worth looking at. And she talks about, well, you know, try observing the things that aren't unusual, the things that are just normal. And she's really got me into that now. So got me when I'm out and about, I'll try and write down and observe things that are not different. They're just a person sitting on a bench, not doing anything, not being punched or anything like that. And I'll try and I try and write that down. And it's an interesting exercise, actually, to try and just describe something that is just normal or ultra normal and, and moving away from the unusual. That, that sounds to me like what I, that's what I use poetry for, because my, okay. my fiction is all made up. It, I, I was I could never go anywhere near it anything autobiographical or anything that actually happened in my fiction. I don't know why it made me really, really uncomfortable. And actually almost all my flash fiction comes from prompts. So the one set in the, in the phone box, that small, small inch 
that came from prompts. I can't remember what it was. It's probably red phone box or something like that. Right. So I, it's all made up for me, but poetry suddenly gave me that outlet to take things I saw and things I experienced and, it, and give them a shape that I found comfortable enough to be able to then put them out in the world. So it's become very, and I think I'm getting to a point now where I'm allowing the poetry to become a little weirder and maybe more mm. made up like the fiction. And so there is, there's no real, there's just a blurring of boundaries, but there is so much to be said for just sitting and looking, isn't there? And we don't do enough of it anymore. Mm. Question, question I have listening to, to what you were just saying, Tanya, because I'm conscious you, you both write in other forms. Flash fiction isn't the only thing that either of you do. When, when inspiration strikes or a prompt prompts something in you, do you know that this is the start of a flash piece rather than a poem or a short story or an opera or a sound installation or whatever? Or do you just run with it and what form it's actually going to take is a decision for further down the line? It, it, come, it come, comes to me differently. Well, it has so far. Poems tend to come to me out loud, um, which is probably partly why I haven't been able to write anything for the last eight, nine months. Because often I, I will start writing a poem when I'm on a walk, um, but I have to let my head, let, let myself not, you know, pay too much attention to what's going on around me. And I'll start hearing and poems come to me more a bit like it's like a full body sensation. It's more like a song mm. um, and fiction or prose or whatever you call it tends to come to me when I'm moving my fingers. So it's tended to be very different. And I, I know that they feel different. But then again, there are some things I've written that might be who knows what they are. So I tend to let go of labels Um I think you've got to try for, it took me ages to be able to say that something I'd written was a poem. And then I think you move through that phase and you're able to then let go and think it, it just is what it, whatever it is. It's yeah. a short thing, maybe with line breaks, maybe without. So I'm getting to, I would like to get to a place where there's more blurring. And I write these hybrid things now and I have no idea what they are. Whenever I get a commission, I pretty much say to them, can it be a hybrid? Because then I feel completely free to do whatever I want, which is nice. David? Yeah, I would say that um, things, things could end up as anything I sometimes think. I sometimes look at some of my really short flash fiction stories, like the fella that with his potato smiles on his wall. I think, you know, that could be a novel, couldn't it? You could you could you could make something into something longer very easily, and and I sometimes do worry that flash fiction and I don't write flash fiction much anymore does does gobble up ideas too much and and take up ideas and place and characters and and try and use them close them off and finish them in a very short space. And I sometimes wonder whether they actually need more. Um, so I'm tending at the minute to write longer, longer short stories novels and and I'm writing graphic novels which is a little bit different because it's like writing a film script so you're writing dialogue and ideas and images um so so I think so I mean when I get I still write down bits and bobs and and, and little things I've seen and, and I think yeah maybe that'll be a flash fiction but I know to some people maybe flash fiction looks like an an easy option but but for me to think about doing another collection of 70s stories of flash fiction would be quite daunting mm. <laughs> compared to writing a novel, to be honest. I think, oh God, 70, you know, it's a lot. And I've got to do all that and they've all got to be good, all different and yeah, and all of that. Whereas with a novel, you go into the same world, the same characters, the same places, you're exploring one thing and you're going back to it. In a way, writing a novel, it's a little bit like re reading a novel, I guess. You're going, just going back into the same place. It's familiar and you carry on within it. And yeah. with flash fiction, the difficult thing is you're always starting anew. So all the ideas go in and yeah, who knows where they're going to end up. Yeah, you, you, you've got to be freshly inspired 70 times rather than once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a big ask, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, 
Any any last questions from our audience? I'm just keeping an eye on the time, and we have now been going for wonderful as it's been. We have now been going for two hours, and I suspect some people are now wanting a, a cup of cocoa while they're pudding. <laughs> I don't think there's a question that we haven't got to. I think we've asked everybody's questions. I've been trying to keep a, a careful eye on the chat while we've been going. I, I have one more question for both of you. Obviously, <clears throat> our lovely audience should go out and buy all of your books as quickly as possible. Uh, who else... For, for anybody that, that's been here listening to us all this evening, who's new to, to flash fiction, could you give them some other flash fiction writers that you would really recommend? Or some anthologies? She, she's prepared. got a pistol. <laughs> I brought props because I thought, I, I did a flash fiction reading last week and forgot to bring the props. Um, and I wanted to, the place where I discovered flash fiction 20 or 25 years ago was these set of anthologies. Can you see that? This one is Sudden Fiction. And they came out in the 1990s by, most of them are edited by this guy called Robert Shappard, often with James Thomas. And there are now loads of these anthologies. Sudden Fiction, I think there's more Sudden Fiction. Um, and then Flash Fiction Forward. And if you, if you Google, if you look for James, um, Robert Shappard on anywhere but Amazon, that's just a personal thing, um, you'll find, you'll probably find all sorts of secondhand copies of these and these are multi-author flash fiction anthologies and so sudden fiction they decided to define as when you have to turn the page once um, and flash fiction is when you don't turn the page at all and this is where I discovered all these amazing American short story writers like Grace Paley and Tobias Wolf and Raymond mm. Carver mm. And I fell in love with what you can do in just a couple of pages. So I highly recommend, I can put them in the chat box, but just, just Google Ameri uh, Sudden Fiction and they now have, for example, they have Flash Fiction International. Um, so it's very, very short stories from around the world. So you get all sorts of things in translation as well. And um, yeah, so I would highly recommend starting there. Okay, thank you, David. And I would say, well, there's the publication that Chester University do, uh, the Flash International, which is great. And they put together from submissions uh, the best of Flash that, that they find. Um, I, I like um, Lydia Davis, who I mentioned earlier. And I like a writer called Diane Williams. So I think it's worth looking at her, another American. Um, there's an the English writer called Meg Pokras, who I really enjoy. Um, flash fiction wise and I like um, I, I think flash fiction blurs into what I call the avant-garde poetry scene and I like where it blurs into the avant poets and the Ulipo people so I like people like uh, Tom Jenks so check out Tom Jenks as well if you're thinking about that because it's kind of it's prose poetry in some ways some of it and I think that's where it works quite quite well so I'd say be yeah, read around the prose poetry, read around the, the, the flash fiction too. There's not, a, there's not an awful lot of authors who publish collections of flash fiction, actually. So there's, there's you know, there's small in number, Tanya, me, a few others. So it's mostly in anthologies. Um, and just, just, just to add to that, there's a brand new book just published called The Penguin Book of Ulipo, which I just ordered. That's right. Went yeah. to an event last week. Tom Jenks is in that, and that's a great place to start if you yeah. don't know about Ulipo, which is an interesting French surrealist liter literary movement. Yeah. I say that. Well, sorry, I'm trying to type and listen. And <laughs> I think Teresa's got a question. Teresa? Yes, she has indeed. Uh, let me find Teresa and unmute her, and she can ask her question in person. Hello. 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 Hi. You're the other Teresa. <laughs> no, no, just other, just other Teresa. Right. You, have to, <laughs> you have to flash that. Okay, yeah, so I come from spoken word and poetry, and so I'm the other way around, but I do have a little background in tabloid journalism, and I've only recently discovered Flash. I love it. I love it. It's great. I've, I think I've got quite a short attention span, and when I'm reading the Flash stories, I need to, I, I sometimes get quite bored reading the long things and I think I'm like, get, oh, skip the subplot. I want to know what's happening. 
So this is, I've come to it, I've discovered it, and I want to know what makes you pop when, you, when you're reading flash fiction, you go, oh, wow, that's good. What jumps out at you when, it, when you're looking at something and you think, yeah, they've nailed this? Well, but for me, it's voice. It just starts with voice. It's like, can I, is, does the character leap off the page? And it doesn't have to be the voice of the main character. It can be the voice of a narrator, say. I want to I wanna hear them right from the opening sentence. I don't want them to sound like every single other person. So that's the, that's the thing that grabs me. And I also, got, I've got to say, since I'm, I'm, I'm judging right now. Dave and I, David and I used to joke that at one time, one of us was always judging a flash fiction competition and then we alternated. <laughs> but I think they've got a few more people in now. But um, I much, much prefer a story that takes risks and is a bit messy and maybe doesn't quite hit it, but has really, you know, gone out on a limb than one that's hermetically sealed and perf word perfect and neat. So my, my advice would be take risks and, and if you can hear the voice of your character, there's more of a chance that I'll be able to hear it. So I'm sure from spoken word, that's something that hopefully well, that appeals to you because you can you read it out loud to yourself. Yeah, it's it's not always easy though. This, this is the thing, it's like anything new. I'm, I'm, I'm not yep. expecting it to be easy. It, to be honest, can I use the word head fuck? My daughter's gone to bed. It, 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 <laughs> that's how it feels sometimes. Like, oh my God, I've, I've if I, I, somebody said about editing and cutting it out, I'm, you know from writing poetry, you can agonise about a word for ages. I've almost had a breakdown writing a poem recently <laughs> about a midlife crisis. So it's, it's kind of, it fits. I, I should say as well, I spent seven years just going on short story workshops before I had anything published. So, you know, it, it doesn't, it, like David was saying, just because it's short doesn't mean it's easy. No. <laughs> yeah, and flash fiction writers struggle over single words in the same way as poets do. That's what you do because you're writing an exposed form, which every word's paying its way and every word's got to work and everything. So, so yeah, there's a lot of similarities, um, I think. So you that, that you that you haven't got with a longer piece where you can skate over words a little bit more. I'm, I'm trying to remember who said it. There's a lovely quote. Um, I'm sorry to have written you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a shorter one. And there's lots of people yeah. that's attributed to Mark Twain, Seneca, I think. We never, we're never quite sure who said that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what do you look for when you're judging, David, when you're judging a competition? Well, I'm judging a competition. The strange thing about judging a competition is you get a snapshot of the you get a snapshot of the type of people who are now doing creative writing, which is yeah. really interesting. And, and, the, and then you get a, a snapshot of the type of issues that they're going through in their lives. So you get, it's a, it's a, it's a strange process. So you get a lot of people who are maybe often all, all of a certain age, often they've got parents who are older and dying and, and going through dementia. So you get this whole picture of people who are at a certain point, which is, which, which is quite, I don't know, it's distracting in some ways, but, but interesting. But what you're always looking for is somebody who, they may be able to think of a good premise for a story and a good scenario, but they need to be able to put the story in there too. And that's what you're looking for in flash fiction, I think, is the story, not just the setup. And if people can do that, and, and at the same time be engaging with it, and, and different and, um, you know, and, and, and also use some language that's interesting. That's what you want. But, but so I it's mean, easy. it's so easy. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you should know, though, that um, about 70 or 80 percent of the entries that I get for a competition will immediately go onto my no pile. So and sometimes more than that. So you shouldn't please don't ever think you shouldn't send something in because maybe it's not literary enough or something like that. Please, please give the judges the chance to read your work because we get this whole pile. Um, and often there's quite a lot of work that just doesn't spark off the page at all. And people haven't really understood what flash fiction is either. And the only way you figure it out is by reading really, isn't it? You know, you just read as much as possible and see what kinds of flash fiction you love. And then maybe that's what you want to write. Good answers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Just do it. Yeah.
Can I can I set you both up with a with a, a final question to to round us off? Uh, a kind of devil's advocate question, so forgive me, but. Uh, We've covered an awful lot of ground, uh, fascinatingly, this evening. What did you want to say about flash fiction that the questions or the, the, the structure of the evening hasn't yet given you the opportunity to say? What, what haven't we said yet? Mm, that's, that's interesting. Um, I think that what, one of the things that you get asked quite a lot at events that I do is, is flash fiction popular? And is it a form that people want to buy and people want to read? And I think that that's the difficult question. And I think in general, the average reader that I know that goes to the library and, and gets books and reads a lot, doesn't want to read flash fiction, I have to say. They mostly want to read novels. And um, so the marker, although people talk about things like, oh, the market must be great for flash fiction because people have um, shorter attention spans. They talk about things like that. But people, people don't have shorter attention spans. People will watch a box set at the weekend that lasts four, they will binge four or five hours on a box set. They'll watch films that last three hours. They'll read giant novels. Attention spans are not getting shorter. Attention spans, I think, uh, are getting deeper. And, and, and people expect a lot of depth now and a lot of complexity in, 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 in their fiction, be it on screen, on film, or in novels and all of that. So I think flash fiction is a, is a form that kind of sits in a funny place, really. Most people I know who write it and read it are creative writing people uh, most of the time. Most of the people I know who are uh, readers, who are punters, who just read books, tend not to read it. Tanya might have a different view, but that's my that's my view of where I am now. What do you think, Tanya? Well, yeah, I, you know, there aren't many, it's like mostly poetry is being read by other poets. So, you know, this mm. is, I realized long ago that I wasn't gonna become famous through flash fiction, but this leads me to my point, which I've had more time to think about. Thank you, David, for going first. Oh. Is that just, firstly, just write for yourself because you have no idea who's out there and who might read it. So write for yourself. And the joy for me of flash fiction, and I think this is possibly what we haven't said yet, and I see this a lot because I'm running a load of flash fiction workshops at the moment, is what the severe word constraint gives you is permission to leave things out. It gives you permission for what you don't have to include because you can't include it because there's no space. But that, that said, it doesn't mean that there are things you can't do in flash fiction. It doesn't mean that you can't have lots of characters. It doesn't mean you can't have description. It doesn't mean you can't have backstory. It doesn't mean you can't move around in time. You can do everything, but it also gives you permission to not have to, like I think you can see this with David's fictions really clearly. You don't have to describe the world that you're, you're enticing the reader into. You just throw us right in there. Um, so permission is a huge word for me. So constraint gives me permission for all the things I can let go of. And I love it. And I've just finished the, the end of the, I always do for the very last exercise of a flash fiction workshop, we write a drabble, which is exactly 100 words. And suddenly when you get that, when it clicks, you think, why did I ever use more than 100 words? And it starts to feel enormous. Um, so yeah, permission not to have to put everything in. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I was thinking, listening to you just then. Uh, yesterday evening, I would. I, I'm a member of a book club, and we read novellas uh, because it takes up less time to everybody's month. Uh, and we read uh, Fred Ullman's Reunion. I don't know if either of you know that uh, wonderful little-known book. Uh, Fred Ullman was German, uh, left Germany in about 1935. He was from a, a Jewish family. His parents sent him abroad for basically for his own safety. Uh, it's not an autobiographical story. He, he makes that abundantly clear in the introduction, but that's, that's the context. And there's, it's a very lightly sketched story of one of those really intense teenage friendships and the friend is from a, a very high-born German family. 
he can't figure out how they manage to befriend each other because they have so little in common. The the, the Jewish young boy is a, a doctor's son, which comparatively is is kind of almost peasant stock. Uh, but the friendship falters, and it turns out that the 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 highborn son's mother is uh, closely involved with the Nazi party and won't have him in the house and wants the friendship to end. At which point he emigrates and 30, 40 years later is sent an alumni booklet by the school that they were all at, which includes this is what happened to everybody in your class. And he doesn't want to open it because he doesn't want to know, he doesn't want to think back about that. He finally makes himself read it and all it says about his friend was implicated in plot to kill Hitler, executed. And as everybody said when we talked about it, that's, that's what, five or six words? That's an entire another novella in five or six words. And it's an absolutely killer ending. But I, I was thinking about what Tanya was saying about what you leave out. It's also what you leave in, but you manage to draw with, with one very quick stroke. It's, it's like those wonderful Japanese paintings of fish where it's, it's three brush strokes on a piece of paper. There were no eyes, they hadn't drawn the scales, the fins, but you look at it and go, that's a fish and it's moving. Uh, and it's that kind of economy. That, that to me is the real skill of, of good flash. To... On which note, I think it is time to say a huge thank you to David and Tanya. I'm going to unmute everybody again. Thank you. Like a proper round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Us. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you, you, both of you. You've been Thanks for having us. Fascinating. <laughs> I'm and looking forward to, to coming to the real Milton Keynes next time. Yes. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> See you all soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your great questions. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Thanks for answering them. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for organising. <laughs>